Boar's Head invites you to enlighten your senses. Introducing Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki Style Chicken. Inspired by Japanese master chefs, our signature teriyaki glaze is crafted with garlic, ginger, and a hint of brown sugar. Then paired with our tender, slow-roasted chicken breast for a flavor that's sweet, savory, remarkably bold. Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki Style Chicken. The bold flavor of Japan. Now at the deli. Compromise elsewhere. Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. October is Black History Month in the UK, and do we have a treat for you today? Colin Grant is an author, historian, and a BBC radio producer. He has worked as a scriptwriter, produced several radio dramas. Grant is also an associate fellow at the Yesi Pissar Center for Caribbean Studies, Warwick University, and a judge on the Watsafari New Writing Prize. The son of Jamaican immigrants to the UK in the late 1950s, Grant has written a trilogy of books that observe the African-Caribbean life of the 20th century, his first book was an acclaimed biography of Marcus Garvey, Negro with a Hat, The Rise and Fall of Marcus Garvey. His second hailed one of the best music books for 2011, I and I, The Natural Mystics, Marley, Tosh, and the Whaler, is the first group biography of the Whalers, although it was the much of a social history of Jamaica. And his third, a departure from his nonfiction writing, Baggy at the Wheel is a comic memoir based on his father, Clinton George Baggy Grant. And growing up in the 1970s in Luton, at the time a provincial town with very few West Indians. As always, my co-host Chris Daly will do the interview, so take it away, Chris. Thanks, Denise, and welcome, a warm welcome to you, Colin. It's good to be able to dialogue with you this afternoon. Likewise, thank you. Yeah. Just want to understand a little more of your roots to, you know, beyond the U.K. Tell us a little about um, your Caribbean roots from your parents' perspective. Yes, both parents born in Jamaica. Um, my mother was born in 1932, my father a little bit earlier than that. My mother's from Kingston, uh, St. Andrews is the district in Kingston where she's from, and my father's from St. Anne's Bay, which is where Marcus Garvey was from. And they oh. both left Jamaica in the late 50s and um, started a new life here in the UK, in, in the so-called motherland, and we've been here ever since. Okay, wonderful. So you were born in the UK, and, um, uh, you know, we know the, the as far as Black History Month in the U.S., um, where most of our audience is it's usually in February, but in the UK it's actually in October. Uh, tell us a little about the history of how this um, this um, period of learning took place in the UK. Well, it all began in 1987, actually, and it was the um, centenary of Marcus Garvey's birthday, and there were some activists in London, part of a, an organisation called the the GLC, the Greater London Council, and they uh, got together to advocate on the part of uh, the fact that there was a kind of silence or a darkness over the presence, the historical presence of black people in this country, and they wanted to make amends for that. Prior to that, there'd been no real um, recognition of black contribution to the UK, and so they were trying desperately to make amends. When I was growing up in the 60s and 70s in the UK, there were very few black faces on television or even in radio, and there were very few mentions of black authors in books. And so this is a way of trying to right that wrong. In Jamaica, we say that half the story has never been told. And these activists in the 1980s, in 1987, were trying to right that wrong and trying to right the second half. So it began then, and it's been going strong ever since. I've just uh, done quite a few things already this month for Black History Month, and um, 
I'll be doing some more as the month progresses. That's wonderful. Um, in the U.S., um, Dr. Martin Luther King is the dominant folks that you deal a profile during this month, along with the civil rights movement. And from what you said, it seems like Marcus Garvey plays a significant role. Are there other um, personas that actually are considered huge during this time that people are really focusing on? Well, there aren't that many, um, and it's a bit of a pity, really. I think the black presence in Britain, although it's been long and tortuous, it hasn't been as dominant as the black presence in the United States of America. And there hasn't been a great tradition of honoring the black presence. So apart from Marcus Garvey, there are figures like Bernie Grant, who uh, was one of the first black uh, politicians elected um, in the 80s in this country. Uh, aside from him, we have to look back further into history. Uh, one of the people I'll be writing on in a forthcoming book is a man called Ignatius Sancho, who was a 18th century African in London. Uh, he was born on a slave ship. His mother died in childbirth, and his father committed suicide, throwing himself overboard. And Ignatius Sancho uh, came to the UK and was given to three maiden women in Greenwich. But he caught the eye of a social anthropologist and a kind of social engineer, a man called the Duke of Montague. And he became this learned scholar, this Latin scholar, and this man who wrote uh, enormously attractive and long letters to the highfalutin people of the day. So Ignatius Sancho was, in a way, one of the first uh, advocates uh, to try to bring about the end of the Atlantic slave trade from this country. And so he was commemorated along with people like uh, Aluda Equiaro and Mary Seacole. So those are the people that we most remember, but the contemporary figures are far and few between, I'm afraid. How is a persona like Mandela considered in the UK? I think like um, uh, around the globe, um, Nelson Mandela is revered and loved um, as a man who typifies what I think is the most amazing facet of African life, which is the capacity to forgive. And he's recognized as a man who's suffered a lot, who spent many, many years in Robben Island, who, whose life, whose middle life was spent behind bars, and yet he came out of that jail and was full of forgiveness and full of an idea that we will draw a line in the sand and start again. And that capacity to, to forgive and to find allies and to forge uh, relationships with people who have formerly been enemies is one thing that is much, much admired in the UK. That's wonderful. And so what are some of the ways that um, this recognition and celebration takes place in, in the UK? Well, there yeah. are many, many um, musical uh, celebrations. Uh, I've written a book, as uh, your colleague mentioned, on the uh -huh. original Whalers, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and Bunny Whaler. Uh, as we know, there were many books on, on Bob Marley, but there hasn't until recently been ever a biography of Peter Tosh or of Bunny Whaler. And so during this month, there are many kind of commemorations of the importance of Rastafari and of reggae, the way that the music has actually informed much of the contemporary music in this country. In the late 1950s, a wonderful Jamaican called Louise Bennett wrote a poem mm -hmm. called Colonizing England in Reverse. And what she was talking about was the fact that for 400 years, uh, Jamaica and black people in the Caribbean were colonized by the English, that we looked towards England as a motherland. People in the Caribbean were Afro-Saxons or uh, Afrophiles. They loved England, Anglophiles. Um, Louise Bennett talked about the fact that there were so many Jamaicans coming to the UK, bringing with them not just their love of life, but also their culture, so much so that actually, if you look at much of the tapestry of culture in the UK today, it's forged and enlivened by the Caribbean and especially the Jamaican input. So we honor people like um, Louise Bennett and the Whalers, and there's m many, many uh, opportunities for people to go and listen to old-school reggae during this month as well. That's great. G give us a snapshot at what the demographics look like for um, Jamaicans in the U.K. these days. Well, 
um, most Jamaicans are in the major conurbations, so in the major cities such as London, and in London, in various parts of London, uh, Brixton is still a, a great source of uh, finding Jamaicans, as is Notting Hill. Uh, places like Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, and even Luton, where I'm from, which is a small town um, north of London. Uh, but these are very thriving um, Caribbean populations. And one of the things that I wanted to do with my writing was to commemorate and to memorialize these people. So many of the people that I write about are still alive and um, thriving in places like Brixton and Luton and Liverpool. And what I wanted to do in my book was to um, capture a sense of the flavor of those people and their essence. Because a lot of uh, Jamaicans, when they came to this country, came with their sense of style intact. And I'm sure many uh, of, these, of the listeners to your program will, will remember the images that they might have seen of Caribbean people coming to the UK with their fedoras and their fine suits. And that is true of the people who came to Luton and I grew up with. So, for instance, there were wonderful characters who had these wonderful nicknames that defined them. So Shine was bald, Tidy Boots, very fussy about his footwear, Pumpkin Head had a pumpkin-shaped head, clock had one arm longer than the other and my all time favorite was a man they called Summerwear and when Summerwear came to this country from Jamaica in the early 60s he insisted on wearing light summer suits no matter the weather uh, in the course of actually writing my book uh, Bad Guy at the Wheel I asked my mum whatever became of Summerwear and she said well pretty soon he caught a cold and died so my mm. book is a kind of tribute to those colorful characters who came with the sense of style intact back in the 50s and 60s your your dad is the main, the main character, and how did he get that name? What's it? Yeah, my dad is the my father is the main character. His nickname is Bag Eye uh, because uh -huh. he has baggy eyes, and I think that okay. was a tradition. Uh, maybe it still exists in the Caribbean of people giving each other nicknames, and so they uh, sometimes they didn't like their nicknames, but uh, they had to accept it and take it on the chin. He had baggy eyes from the age of 16, and he had a condition called subcutaneous edema. Um, so he, he wasn't born with them, but he developed these baggy eyes. And um, uh, a few years ago, when I went to see him in order to give him the book, I went to a, a Jamaican pub in Luton where he lives. And uh, I was struck by the fact that nobody knew his real name, Clinton George Grant. They all knew him as Bag Eye. Um, okay. So in a way, even though he may not have liked the name, it's a name that defines him. That's incredible. So and so, you're, 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 you 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 use the the vehicle as a, as a novel. But your prior work you did nonfiction, but now you decide to use the novel as a vehicle to actually communicate that uh, story. Give us um, what inspired you to to switch to switch gen, um, gen the way you go about doing it. And, and, sure. and pursuing it. Sure. Well, I, I work as a BBC radio producer for my day job, and that's quite a privilege. And one of the things I've been able to do in the course of my long career in the BBC is to make many programs about the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I made a program called Caribbean Voices, which is a tribute to a program that first appeared on the BBC World Service over 50 years ago. And this wow. is a program which gave the first start to many of the famous Caribbean writers that are around today, people like George Lamin, V.S. Naipaul, Sam Selvin, Andrew Salkey. And if you look at those authors, you see that there was a very vibrant, very rich period in the 50s when many of these Caribbean voices were coming through. And... For my mind, one of the finest books that came out of the period was a book called The Lonely Londoners by Sam Selvin. And if you look carefully, Chris, between then and now, you'll see that actually there haven't been that many books that have carried along that tradition in this country. There have been people like Andrea Levy and, and Zadie Smith, but actually maybe only a handful of people. And when I came to write my book, Bad Guy at the Wheel, I looked back to that period, that golden period, as I see it, of people like Sam Selden and Andrew Salkey. And I wanted to capture the flavor of the lives that they were portraying 
which were right. clear to me from the people around my father. So actually, when I tried to write my book, I thought of them, but I also thought of people like the characters in Guys and Dolls, because many oh. of the people around my parents had that kind of pizzazz, had that kind of style, and I wanted to capture a sense of their energy and their humor. And so the book, in a way, uh, I hope, uh, captures that because my father and his colleagues, his friends, they drummed into us a mantra when we were growing up in this country. And the mantra was, you are being watched. And by that, mm. they meant you are being watched by the host nation oh. to see which way you turn, to see whether you conform to some stereotype that they have of you, the Englishman mm. has of you, of being feckless, of work shy, of destined for a life of crime. So confound that expectation and show your best face to the world. And that was true of the characters in books by Naipaul and Sam Selvin. And it's true of the characters that I write about in Bad Guy at the Wheel. Is there is there a, a vignette that you, you think you could share with us just to whet your appetite? That you said, boy, this is... Uh, yes, this is um, I flavor. haven't got the book to hand, but I can tell you that one of the things that I write about is um, the fact that a lot of my uh, father's friends, as he worked in a factory, a car factory called uh, Vauxhall Motors. They have the, you know, it's, it's a product of the American Vox, General Motors. But every Friday, um, Chris, these men would get their wages in a little brown envelope from Vauxhall Motors, and they would head home, and they would, they would get to the ironing board, and they would iron their suits and their shirts. And once okay. they had done that, they would then head for Mrs. Knight's all weekend poker game where they would fry their okay. chicken uh, and they would prepare their rum and coke and they would gamble away and it was my job actually as a 10 year old boy and the job of my siblings to get to Mrs. Knight's gambling poker game on Saturday afternoon and stand at the poker game table to embarrass our father into giving us some house money otherwise come Sunday morning he and his friends would emerge from Mrs. Knight's all weekend gambling house, blinking into the sunlight, penniless. So it's a rather a pitiful tale, but also a, an amusing tale about how these men um, tried to um, juggle their love of of gambling and love of uh, conviviality that you get with rum and poker, but also juggle that with their responsibility towards their children. That's what the book's really about. That's a wonderful contrast, Colin. This is that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank Tell you. us a little, we didn't get to explore your career uh, a little. How did you get to be uh, a producer at the BBC? Well, it's a, a rather long and tortuous route. <laughs> I'm 51 years old now, and um, as a an, uh, young adult, actually, I went to medical school. I studied medicine for about five years, uh, mm -hmm. but even whilst I was at medical school, I was writing plays. And uh, eventually, it was the love of literature which drew me more than the love of medicine. Uh, rather like Anton Chekhov, I would say that uh, ah. uh, medicine was my wife, but writing was my mistress. And so okay. soon after me medical school, I went and started to write plays and put them on in theatres and in festivals like the Edinburgh Festival. Um, and actually... During that time, I realized that there wasn't a lot of money to be made from writing plays, and I'd been socialized to the idea that through medicine, I would be having quite a comfortable life. So one day, I saw an advert for trainee BBC producers, and I just managed to go in there and uh, persuade them that I was the right person for them, and that was about 20 years ago. And in that time, I've worked in the World Service, but also domestic radio here. I've done TV dramas, script editing plays, and I've written lots of documentary dramas um, for the BBC World Service, and presently I'm a producer in the science unit in BBC Radio. That's just a marvelous story, Colin. This is great. I'm very proud of you. Um, Thank you. If someone would like to, to um, get your work, you know, especially your latest book, Bad Guy, how would they get that? Is, that, is it on Amazon or on the other... Um, yes, it, it's, it's on Amazon. It's, Amazon is the kind of the easiest route. Um, 
I have a very active website called colingrant.info. And if uh -huh. uh, people want to just Google my name, Colin Grant, then they'll see my website. And my website will draw them to links um, uh, about my books. Uh, but I'm also very keen to pay tribute to other writers. So one of the things we didn't speak about was the fact that during the Black History Month, one of the things that I think is exciting is that you meet uh, other like-minded people. And just mm -hmm. two days ago, I did an event in Brighton, in the south coast of England where I live, with a wonderful poet called Hannah Lowe. And she's recently been shortlisted for very prestigious prizes in the UK. But Hannah Lowe is a child of an English mother and a African-Chinese-Jamaican man. And she's okay. written a book called, called Chick. And in a way, what Chick. was intriguing to me was that both our parents, both Hannah's father and my father, were these great gamblers. Um, and in a way, Hannah Lowe, in her book Chick, is trying to do for Jamaican people in this country through poetry what I am trying to do through prose. But if anyone is interested in my work and Hannah's, then they can click on my link, Colin Grant, and, and they'll quickly find her as well. So that's Colin Grant, that info, and then you have a link to her work at, from your site. Yeah, I, if they go to my site, they'll they'll see the events that I've done in recent months, and if they click on one of them, then that will take them to Hannah Lowe. But Hannah Lowe, H A N N A H, and then L O W E, and they can just look for her name on the internet as well, and they'll find her. She has quite a, a formidable internet presence because she's got a powerful body of work out there now. Oh, wonderful. So, do you want to give us a hint? What 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 can we expect from Colin Grant next? Well, uh, I would love to be able to write a book about a wonderful poet and musician called Linton Crazy Johnson, uh, oh. who was a Jamaican, uh, born about 60 years ago, and he's known around the world as a dub poet, but he's primarily a poet, but also a musician. And he sold more than three million um, records in his life. Uh, he famously, uh, a few years ago, was uh, offered a six-album deal with Chris Blackwell of Island Records and turned Chris Blackwell down. Because rather like many Jamaicans, he's a man who wants to keep his powder dry and wants to be his own boss. And I admire people like him. He's not a million miles away from Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey said... Up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. And Linton Quasi Johnson is the 21st century personification of that. So if I can persuade Linton to allow me to write his book, I think it'll be a glorious thing. We'll be praying for that kind of possibility. This is wonderful. Thank you. It's delighted to hear what's happening in the UK around uh, Jamaicans really making sure that our legacy do not die in the same kind of spirit of courage and entrepreneurship is being promoted. So, in closing, do you have any final wisdom for us, Colin? Well, I think one of the things I learned from researching my book on Marcus Garvey is that you must search for allies and keep your allies close and recognize who the enemy is. The big problem that Marcus Garvey had with his enemies was that he mistook who his enemies were. He mistook W.E.B. Du Bois and the NAACP as the enemy, whereas the UNIA, that's Garvey's organization, and the NAACP should have been united. They should not have yes. been, as Freud would say, driven apart by a narcissism of minor differences. So I would say to everybody, cleave together, look to see who your allies would be, and together you will grow strong. That's a really powerful piece of wisdom. Thank you so much, Colin. And Thank to you. learn more about Chris Daly, visit Let's Get Mobile and Social. To learn more about Jamaican Diaspora, visit JamaicanDiaspora.com. And to learn more about Colin, visit ColinGrant.info. Thanks, Colin. Bye now. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be hard. Like early 90s heavy metal hard. I'm yelling and screaming and I'm loud. Roar. Geico makes it easy. You can review and update your policy or report a claim on Geico.com or the Geico mobile app. Because shouldn't we all have a little less stress in our lives? I'm not even upset about anything. Boar's Head invites you to enlighten your senses. Introducing Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki Style Chicken. Inspired by Japanese master chefs, our signature teriyaki glaze is crafted with garlic, ginger, and a hint of brown sugar. Then paired with our tender, slow-roasted chicken breast for a flavor that's sweet, savory, remarkably bold. Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki Style Chicken. The bold flavor of Japan. Now at the deli. Compromise elsewhere.